Okay, let's go ahead and get this session started. Thank you all for, uh, for attending today right after lunch. Um, so this is an introduction to a project called Rook. And my name is Jared Watts. I'm uh, one of the senior maintainers for the project. I've been, uh, been involved with it since its founding a couple of years ago. And then I'm also a founding engineer at a startup company in Seattle called Upbound. So I have never given a talk uh, where there is live translation going on. So um, I've been told that I speak really, really rapidly. So I'm doing my best to try to slow that down a little bit today. To um, Not that I don't think the translators are amazing, but I uh, want to give everyone as a good of opportunity as possible to understand. Uh, so OK, so let's talk about what Rook is. So the little tagline that you can use to talk about Rook is that it's a cloud native storage orchestrator. And so what that really means is that it takes Kubernetes and it extends it with a bunch of controllers and custom types that we'll get into a little bit. And then with all that extension of Kubernetes, it brings uh, storage solutions, distributed storage systems into the Kubernetes cluster. So the way it does that is by taking those storage systems and automates the heck out of them. There's a whole big long list there um, that you know we can see that uh, maybe I should read it actually because um, it's it's only in English. Uh, but yeah, the deployment of storage solutions, um, getting it set up, configuring it, uh, provisioning storage for pods on demand, scaling it up, scaling it down, upgrading it to a new version. You know, there's, there's all sorts of tasks that you need to do on a storage system to make sure that it's reliable, healthy, and functional. Uh, so then Rook, uh, we started with just doing this for a storage system called Ceph. And uh, since then, we've extended Rook to be more of a framework for different types of storage providers uh, that we'll get into. So now Rook is kind of a more general framework for bringing storage solutions into Kubernetes. Um, it's an open source project. And it's hosted by the Cloud Native Computing Foundation. Uh, we were first accepted into the CNCF um, as a sandbox level project, you know, the very entry level there, back in January of this year. And uh, just a couple months ago, we did the work to make a, submit a proposal to be uh, upgraded to the incubator level. So now we are an incubation project in the CNCF, and uh, which I think is really cool personally this time because. This is my first KubeCon where I showed up and there's flags of our project out front and they're selling socks in the store and stuff like that. And I thought that was super cool to come here and, and see that. And that's because we're an incubator project now. So it feels like it's a real project once you have socks that people are selling in a store. Okay, so let's talk about uh, traditionally uh, what, sto what storage has been like inside Kubernetes. Um, so in, normally what you have is that you've got uh, an external storage solution that's running somewhere outside of the Kubernetes cluster. Um, there's a whole bunch of solutions for that. You know, all the cloud providers have their managed services. Um, you know, Amazon's Elastic Block Store or Google Persistent Disk. Um, you know, there's a lot of different uh, appliances. You can buy a hardware appliance and have that set up with an endpoint that your Kubernetes apps can talk to and get their storage that way. But the key here is that that storage is outside of the Kubernetes cluster. Now there's a whole bunch of work that was done to kind of integrate that storage in with cl uh, Kubernetes clusters through what's called volume plugins. Uh, but let's, let's talk about what some of the limitations of that are. Uh, the first thing is that it's not very portable. So what I mean by that is that if you have a Kubernetes application and it's using a particular type of storage from Amazon's cloud provider, if you go over to Google's cloud provider or you know Alibaba or uh, Azure or whatever, you're not going to have that same service anymore. You, you've lost your portability. Uh, this also puts a burden on somebody for, to deploy that thing. Uh, you know, an administrator has to go plug in wires for your appliances, has to go set up all the storage, make sure it's accessible. Um, you know, in vendor lock-in, we kind of talked about there, if you're taking a dependency, if your app uses a uh, service from one of the cloud providers, uh, you can't just go somewhere else, take your business and go to another cloud provider. You're kind of locked in. So let's talk about the, the approach that Rook has taken, and, um, and that's really storage on or in Kubernetes. So instead of having the storage outside somewhere, uh, let's bring it right on in to Kubernetes. Uh, because Kubernetes is amazing at lifecycle management, 
uh, health management, um, scaling upgrades, all that sort of stuff. There's so much work that has gone into Kubernetes itself as a platform. Uh, and nobody, we, you know, let's use that for storage too. So let's bring our storage components into Kubernetes and have it manage the life cycle um, and manage some of the health and, you know, take advantage of what is now becoming a very strong, um, you know, distributed systems management platform, which is Kubernetes. Uh, and then this makes our applications really portable too, where if we can have our storage inside Kubernetes, that means that our storage can go anywhere Kubernetes goes. And uh, <laughs> every KubeCon, the list grows bigger for how many places Kubernetes runs now. I finally got accepted into DigitalOcean's um, you know, on-demand Kubernetes service. I'm sure some other people have already been in it, but I finally got accepted a couple days ago. Uh, and it's just you know more and more places Kubernetes is running. It's taking over the world. So if you have storage that runs inside of Kubernetes, you get to go wherever Kubernetes goes. Okay, so how, how does this happen? Um, there's two concepts here, two key concepts that uh, are really Kubernetes general, and uh, Rook makes heavy usage of them, so let's take, take a look at them now. So the first is what's called the operator pattern. Uh, the first place I ever heard of the operator pattern uh, was from CoreOS um, before they got bought by Red Hat, before they got bought by IBM. So CoreOS kind of got eaten up there, but um, they're doing well as far as I know. Uh, so it's really what it is, is that it's a way to automate in software the tasks that an operator or an administrator would normally have to do manually. So, you know, things like uh, making sure the system's healthy or upgrading some parts or failing a part over that's, uh, that's crashing. All those things that, you know, an administrator normally has to type in manually with commands. Uh, let's take that knowledge and let's put it into software, an operator in software that runs inside Kubernetes. And so the three steps that, it, that all operators use is they first have to observe what the state of the system is. They can use the Kubernetes API to ask, hey, what is this pod doing? Is it healthy? Is the stateful set, you know, how many replicas are in the stateful set are running? Um, and then so it observes that state, then it analyzes to see, okay, this is what's actually happening. And the user has asked, they have said that they desire this to happen. What's the difference between actual and desired? And then the operator will take steps. This automated software will take steps or perform operations to make this actual state go towards the desired state and make sure that what the user wants is actually happening in their cluster. The second key concept here to note, take note of is this concept called custom resource definitions or CRDs. Uh, this is the way the, the formally um, supported way that Kubernetes allows you to uh, teach it about new objects, extend Kubernetes to define your own ob arbitrary objects. There was an amazing talk uh, this morning. I don't know if anybody saw it, but it was about how to test these CR uh, CRDs by Christy Wilson, I believe her name is, from Google, and it was a really good talk. I'd suggest uh, trying to catch the uh, recording of that later on. It was really good. But basically, uh, this allows you know, your own app, uh, your own objects, to look like any other built-in object, you know, a pod or a config map. You can make you know, your foo object look just like, uh, from kube control, the command line, look just like any other first-class built-in object. And so that enables us to integrate our storage solutions to integrate very nicely in uh, with Kubernetes. Okay, so the Rook operators, uh, there's, there's a number of these operators. And what they do is they implement this operator pattern we were just talking about for storage solutions specifically. So you know they, uh, these, these custom objects that they define like a cl storage cluster or a storage pool, object storage, it defines those with custom resources. And so the user can specify how they want their storage cluster to look. And then this operator pattern is sitting there watching for those custom resources to get created. And then it, it, uh, it'll make in actual, the actual state of the cluster reflect what the user has said they want in their desired state of these custom resources. Um, so it does that just by sitting in a loop and getting events from the Kubernetes API server saying, hey, this guy wants a storage cluster with these parameters, and the operator will see that and make the changes to make that happen. And so that means, it, so it's using the Kubernetes API, so it can use anything that the Kubernetes API can do. You know, services, config maps, secrets, all that stuff. We have access from the Rook operators to do any of that stuff. So we can do everything that Kubernetes allows you to do. And that gets interesting 
because you can start doing some more complicated um, you know, administrative tasks in, with uh, automation you know, to make sure that data is balanced around the cluster in a healthy way, to make sure that the cluster is healthy, uh, that, you know, to upgrade it from one version to another. And so a very key part to note here is the last bullet. So these operators here, they are not part of the data path. So you've got you know, a distributed storage technology like Ceph or Minio or uh, databases like CockroachDB. Uh, the Rook operators don't do anything with the data. When you write or read bytes of data from the storage system, it doesn't touch the Rook operators at all. The Rook operators are really about deploying the system, configuring it, making sure it's healthy, kind of like a, a storage admin. You know, if you write a byte to your storage disk, you don't go at, tell the admin that you're writing a byte, right? You go right past the admin and go directly to the, to the, uh, to the data path. So the Rook operators, you can turn them off for a while and your data is still healthy, available, good to go. So here's a little bit of a busy slide about the architecture. So let's uh, break this down. On the left, we start with kube control, you know, the normal command line uh, process that you use to interact with Kubernetes. And um, so the first thing you notice is that there's some new objects that get exposed in kube control for storage, you know, clusters, pools, object storage, file storage, databases, all these storage concepts are now first class citizens inside kube, uh, kube control. So we move over a little bit to the middle of the diagram. And so one of the very important things here is that the center of all this is really the Kubernetes API. That's what allows all this to happen, is that you know, we can make calls to the Kubernetes API to say, hey, make me a pod or make me a stateful set. And we get information from the Kubernetes API of saying, okay, the stateful set now has four replicas. Um, do you want more? You, know, you can uh, change it at runtime. Uh, so then the top right here, these are where the operators are running the Rook operators such as Ceph and uh, Minio and CockroachDB. And so they're running there, they're talking to the Kubernetes API, they're launching uh, the required or the desired storage daemons of the actual storage technology like Ceph, uh, gets those up and running. And then the last part to note here is that there is a Rook agent that runs uh, side by side um, with the kubelet on every node. And the pur purpose of that is that when a pod needs storage, um, you know, it needs a volume to be uh, on the same pod, sorry, on the same node that the pod has been, is going to run on. And so the Rook agent takes care of doing that for you. And currently it's using a flex volume, but that's gonna be uh, the, a CSI plugin is already underway and I think kind of pretty close to getting to merge to master soon. All right, so for Ceph, uh, this is just kind of give you an idea of what it looks like. So we, uh, on the left here, we have what is a custom resource for a, a storage cluster, a Ceph cluster. And we see a couple things here of interest. Uh, first, the user is saying, I want uh, V13 of the Ceph storage technology. Uh, I want three of the monitors. Um, I want to use every single, uh -oh. I want to use every single device. Uh, oh, come on now. I want to use all devices that you find on nodes uh, that start with SD and put that on every node in the system. And so the Rook operator takes that YAML specification of how the user wants their cluster to look like, and then takes it uh, and distributes out all the right components like Ceph OSDs and Ceph monitors, Ceph managers, and make sure that's running and happy and healthy in your cluster. All right, so we talked about how Rook can be thought of as a framework now. Uh, we started with just Ceph. Uh, two years ago when the project started, but we've added a couple of uh, new storage solutions since then. So you can, we can start thinking about Rook as more than just these operators and these custom resources, these CRDs. It's also a platform or a set of libraries or reusable uh, specs such that other storage technologies, if they want to get into Kubernetes, can start using those and have a lot easier time than building something on their own or by themselves. Uh, there's a couple different you know, ways that that's, um, that's done where you know, we have Rook provides a normalized common way to specify what storage should be included in the cluster. It's got all the operator patterns and plumbing in it so that you don't have to write the same code over and over again. Um, you can specify different policies. Uh, the testing, integrated testing we have will make sure that a storage solutions, um, you know, effort, sorry, running on Kubernetes works with every build. It's end-to-end uh, -end functional that users can actually rely on it. And so uh, we have, so Rook now has operators for Ceph, CockroachDB, Minio, NFS is in master now, and then Cassandra 
and uh, Nexenta are also ones that are uh, very close to getting done as well. There's pull requests open from them, them as well. I was especially impressed with Cassandra. There's a, a grad student that's in Greece that uh, is doing that for his thesis project. Um, so it's awesome to see contributions coming from the community and from the global community as well to see new storage solutions getting their foot into the door with Kubernetes by integrating in with Rook. All right, so let's, uh, let's get going to a demo here. I think I'm doing pretty good on time. Uh, and there will definitely be time at the end for questions too. All right, so let's get into this demo. All right, so I am going to show a couple of, oops, I made that smaller, not bigger. That was dumb. Okay, I'm gonna show a couple different uh, experiences here with getting storage running inside Kubernetes. So this is just on my laptop. So what I have running is just a, a single, let's see if we can make that even bigger. Yeah, so I've got Minikube running on, inside my laptop now. And let's go ahead and start doing something interesting with it. Now, so these commands here, so I don't have to type, uh, you're not, you don't need to be able to read these, don't worry. But I, I'm really bad at typing during demos. I, I will mess up everything, so this helps me a lot. All right, so the first thing we're gonna do is go ahead, so we're gonna go install Ceph. And uh, this, this slide gets really busy, but basically we have a watch running and talking to the Kubernetes API server so we can see pods coming up and going down um, you know, as everything's running. So what I've done is I've deployed the Ceph operator to this cluster. So now we've got this pod here up and running and it's waiting to, for a user to uh, specify the type of Ceph cluster that they want or file storage, block storage, object storage. So it's just sitting there waiting in a reconcile loop, waiting for us to do something cool. So let's do that. Let's uh, go ahead and create a Ceph cluster. So uh, on, this, uh, on this watch here, what we're gonna be seeing is that, uh, I don't know, has anybody uh, configured Ceph storage, distributed storage on their own before? Did you do it before Rook or manually? Awesome. So you, uh, there are a number of steps that you have to take to get Ceph up and running. Uh, there's a lot of commands and uh, this does this, uh, this takes care of that in an automated fashion. So what we're seeing now is these monitor components for Rook, they're coming up and running, they're figuring out what's uh, alive in the cluster, they're talking to each other, they're establishing a quorum amongst each other, um, and then they'll start bringing up the managers and the object storage daemons. So all these, all these pods, all these components of what is a very complicated distributed storage system has turned into because of this automation from Rook, it's turned into this. Cube control create a cluster. Sure. Uh, yes, so uh, that's the a good thing about YAML files is that there's, well, there's a lot of bad things about YAML files, but, but the good thing about YAML files is that it's a standard file format for Kubernetes configuration, and there's a lot of tools in the ecosystem uh, that can, you can use to generate these. Um, like, for instance, you can use Helm as well to, to install Ceph and specify these parameters as well. I did this manually but there's lots of tools in the ecosystem to, uh, to generate them. Uh, so this is, you know, so I said I want three monitors. Uh, you know, every node in the system you find, give me, use it storage, please. So, you know, just a, a declarative way of saying what you want your storage cluster to do. And, you know, that turned into, by saying create the cluster, that turned into all these pods up and running and healthy as well. So let's keep going here. Let's dive into actually using this storage because right now it's just a storage cluster that's you know, sitting there idle. So let's start using it. And I wanna check on the health of it real quick to make sure things are healthy. So all I'm gonna do right here is I'm running a Ceph status command to uh, poke into the Ceph cluster and see if everything's healthy. And it looks that way. Um, it's not getting into too many Ceph details because they're kind of complicated. But we have our, our storage daemon up and running, and it's got 100 of these placement groups for where you can put data into the cluster. They're all active, they're clean, they're happy. 
So you know, Rook did all this for us, uh, including you know, bootstrapping and setting up the authentication and the, um, the keys, the key rings, and all sorts of stuff. Okay, so we have the storage cluster up, and now we're gonna start using it. So what I'm gonna do now is I am going to show you an application running that's using this Ceph storage. So the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna create a MySQL database. So this MySQL database, I might need to make this smaller to get everything to fit on the screen. So this MySQL database uh, is up and, up and running now. And let's do also put a WordPress uh, application on top of that, of that MySQL database. So this is the interesting part. Um, actually, let's, let's look at one thing first before we get into what's interesting. <laughs> So let's, let's look at the uh, WordPress site and to see if it's uh, up first. So right now I'm just getting the, um, uh -oh. oh. I don't know why I got that extra straggler here. Or not, what, I, what am I doing wrong here? Oh no, I do need that. There we go, okay, sorry about that. All right, so let's open a browser and let's look at what should be um, the WordPress uh, configuration screen. So let's go ahead and say cool, install WordPress. Okay, now let's talk about why this is interesting. So WordPress and MySQL, they're stateful applications. They have data that needs to be stored somewhere. And so when uh, MySQL, the MySQL database is getting put somewhere into the cluster, it needs a backing block volume to store its, its databases. And so this the MySQL pod can end up anywhere in the cluster, really. Um, this is a one node cluster, so it's, you know, bear with me a little bit that it, it's much more interesting in larger clusters. But uh, wherever the MySQL pod is going to go, its storage needs to go with it. And so you know, we have this distributed stor uh, Ceph storage system up and running, and it can service uh, requests for file or block storage anywhere in the cluster. And so wherever MySQL happens to land in the cluster on a particular pod, we're, we have Rook going ahead and saying, OK, I'll get you your block volume. It'll create a virtual block device. It'll mount or sorry, map it to a local RBD block device on that node. It'll mount a file system, and it'll attach the device such that it's now ready for the pod to start using it. And now we're going to see something pretty cool, too. Let's log in and uh, prove that it's um, a stateful application that can store data for us. Okay. All right, so we have a little uh, hello world here post. And let's say, hello KubeCon Shanghai. Okay, so we've posted this. We have a WordPress site, MySQL database, great. Let's get a little crazier though. And let's do something a little, a little wild. So what this command's gonna do is that it's going to get the MySQL pod and it's gonna kill it. So we're basically gonna shoot our database and um, hope for the best. So let's kill MySQL, and we should see that, okay, it's terminating, and another MySQL pod is going to come up in its place, and it's gonna be running. So let's, uh, so let's refresh the page, and our comment is still there, and let's uh, add another comment to show that you know, MySQL database came back. Okay, so this is super interesting, similar to what happened when the MySQL database first deployed. Uh, this kind of similar steps kicked in. So when you killed the, the MySQL database, it's uh, a couple steps have to happen. First, that block volume that the MySQL database was using needs to be detached, unmounted, cleaned up, and then wherever else in the cluster that the MySQL pod ends up, 
Rook has to do the same thing over there to find that block device, map it to a local device on this system using the kernel module, uh, remount it, do not format it so that we're not losing our data, and then once again exposing it to the MySQL pod uh, as a volume again. And all that happens within you know, one or two seconds, which is really nice. Um, and that speaks kind of to the, the flexibility of you know, running your storage inside of Kubernetes because we're taking advantage of all the Kubernetes uh, controllers and primitives and reconciliation loops and informers and caches and all that stuff that Kubernetes is so good at now to uh, basically do the same thing for storage, to make highly available storage that's dynamic in the sense that if your application goes down and has to get moved to another healthier machine, your storage is coming right along for the ride too. All right, so um, I ha we have another session tomorrow that's a deep dive that's going to get into how some of the other cl uh, cluster, uh, sorry, storage technologies like Cockroach and Minio and NFS. And so I'm going to save the rest of the demo uh, of that part of the demo for tomorrow so we can talk about that if you happen to come to the deep dive. Let's get back to our slides now. I think we've got 10 minutes or less. So uh, let's, let's wrap this up and get to questions. Uh, so how to get involved. You know, since Rook is an open source project, we're to, you know, we, uh, we would love to have new contributors. We, we, I think we're up to about 100 different contributors now, people that have written code for, for the Rook project. So that makes me super happy uh, to meet new people that you know, like to write code and want to contribute to the project. And you know, the more, you know, being a CNCF project has gotten us some more visibility. And um, it's really kind of helped out grow that contributor group. Uh, you know, you don't have to write code in order to use Rook. Um, if, you need, if you have storage needs, if you've got stateful applications that need storage, you, know, um, you can just use Rook. You don't have to write code for it. Uh, so we're, you know, we have lots and we have thousands and thousands of users. Um, and you can come talk to us on Slack anytime you want. We're super active there. Uh, we have a global, um, a kind of a global developer group now. So somebody's pretty much always online no matter what time of day it is. Um, you know, we have Twitter, forums, and community meetings as well. Uh, there is, as I mentioned, there's a couple other sessions this week. Uh, right after this, I think in 30 minutes, there is a Meet the Maintainers uh, session at the CNCF booth down in the uh, big sponsor uh, showcase hall. Uh, I'm the only maintainer that was able to come to Shanghai, so you can meet me again. Um, and we can have more to talk about questions or anything. You know, we've got a whole hour to talk. We can get into anything. And then tomorrow, Thursday, I think maybe in this same room, is a deep dive in which we're going to go into some of the code and some of the architecture and talk about how, what the steps are for a storage solution such as Minio or Cockroach to what they need to do to integrate in with Rook and have a uh, cloud native experience that can run inside Kubernetes. All right, so does anybody have any questions? We've got almost 10 minutes or so. Yes? Uh, uh, microphone, yeah, she's coming. Uh, <clears throat> I have two questions. Sure. Uh, question number one, uh, how about uh, Rock's performance in compare of the original Scythe? Uh, uh, the question number two, uh, how about the maturity of the, the Rock? Is it, it is ready to deploy into online or, or production? Yeah, great questions, excellent questions. So the first question was uh, about performance. And so what's interesting to note here is that, you know, Rook is uh, not on the data path. So the storage solutions themselves, like Ceph or Cockroach, are the only ones that will be touching read, uh, uh, bytes that are being read, 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 <laughs> written and re read. Uh, so, and then these con those containers, they get direct access to the raw devices as well. They're, the dev slash dev gets mounted. So there's really not a whole lot of extra layers that are getting added in to degrade performance. So in our benchmarking testing, performance is basically on par with uh, you know, other like bare metal solutions. So the performance is really good. How about network and then for performance? Yeah, so then that kind of can, network performance can start depending on what your, um, your network plugin or your, your CNI network is. Um, so some, uh, some of the storage solutions can uh, have separate uh, networks. Um, uh, they have a network partitions such they can do their own internal chatter on one particular network adapter. 
Um, and then you, you can use the host network too if you wanted to. You can bypass any of the CNI plugins and, uh, and then do other client facing traffic on a different adapter. So uh, networking, you know, you do need to be conscious of how you're setting your network up and you need to know, uh, you know, some of the, um, you know, more advanced techniques for to really get network performance out of a Kubernetes cluster. Um, but, you know, that's on par with anything else. There, there's not any extra networking stuff getting put in to create more layers that get in the way. And so then you asked a question about the stability as well. So Ceph itself is, so, that, so Rook can be thought of as a collection of different storage solutions. And uh, Ceph is the most stable one right now. It's, it's, uh, so Ceph itself has been used for, I think, almost a decade now. It was a research project that came out of uh, UC Santa Cruz. And it's being used in some really massive production deployments, like at the CERN lab. Uh, they are, they're, you know, petabytes and petabytes uh, storage is running on that. So Ceph itself is, is production ready, battle hardened, you know, 10 or, or 13 different releases now. And the support with Rook is going to be stable at KubeCon Seattle. So within a month with our next release, we're going to declare that stable. So it'll be ready for production then. We already do have production users. To get to the incubator stage of the Cloud Native Computing Foundation, you have to have production users uh, and use cases. And so we do already have people running it in production, but now in, at Seattle next month, we'll start saying, you know, recommending that you, to use it in production. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Hi. Uh, how um, do you exactly the have, have availability tested or exception tested on different? Uh, Storage. The, you're asking about availability? High, high availability? The, yeah, high availability. Uh, about the look uh, uh, integrated with the different uh, right. storage. Yeah, uh, and so that's, um, you know, high availability is something that, um, a couple of things. One is that, uh, you know, we're getting a lot of benefit from Kubernetes itself with lifecycle management, where if a component is going down or crashing, uh, you know, Kubernetes itself can recycle, restart it automatically and get it back up and running again to help w increase availability in high, uh, HA. Uh, but the storage solutions themselves, you know, it's very important that they have availability, durability, um, you know, consistency, all that needs to be taken care of by the storage solution themselves. And uh, that's what pretty, all the storage solutions that we have integrated with do a very good job of that such that you know, the default configuration will be, um, for instance, will be like three replicas of each piece of each object, each piece of data, so that you can lose you know, up to two of them and still have the data intact. So everything that we do is with high availability in mind, as well as durability also. When will the rock graduate from CCNCF? Oh, that's a good question. So I, I did I did all the work to oh, that sounds selfish. I'm sorry. I put a lot of work into uh, graduate getting it graduated to the incubating stage, and so to get it to graduate fully is going to be a significant amount of work. I think uh, that somebody was saying this morning that Kubernetes when the CNCF was founded, Kubernetes wasn't even a graduated project. There were zero graduated projects, and Kubernetes Prometheus and Kubernetes have graduated now and Envoy was the third one that was just this, this morning. So Rook has at least a year before we'll fully graduate to get on, on that level. They have a really high bar for graduating projects. But with more contributors helping us out, we can make that happen faster. Okay, thank you. Yeah, yeah a couple more minutes. Okay, thank you. I have questions. <clears throat> and I, I have tried the Mino in, on Kubernetes. And you know, the middle is hard to extend the capacity size. And uh, how look to solve this problem? Oh, to, uh, like to scale it up? Yeah, yes. Right, so, um, so what the Rook uh, Minio operator does is it takes your, um, your object storage uh, request. So this, this is a Minio. We'll, we'll look at this tomorrow in the deep dive too. But this is a Minio object store. It's saying, hey, give me four to start, uh, servers to start out with. And what it does is it takes that request and makes a stateful set of the Minio servers running. And then that stateful set is, uh, you know, can then manage that replica count uh, going forward. So it's, you know, it could be able to scale it up to, you know, five or six uh, or scale it back down as well. 
Um, they each, each replica in that stateful set has a persistent volume backing it underneath, which can be whatever you want it to be. That's arbitrary. Uh, but you know, using that machinery, this is where leveraging the Kubernetes API is so valuable because a lot of this reliability and this functionality comes from the primitives within Kubernetes itself. So you know, the stateful set scaling will be able to scale up and down Meneo. And if it doesn't work, if it doesn't work well, then that's a bug that we should look into and figure that out. But um, you know, that'd be like, and that's in addition to contributing code, contributing issues is great too. If you find an issue where something doesn't work, go to GitHub and, and open up an issue for us to look into it too. But it's supposed to work. Yeah, here at GitHub, you can open up an issue. Another question back there? Question two, uh, can stateful sites with different uh, kind of storage type uh, schedule on the same node? Yes, yeah, that's a great question. Uh, so the first, first question about can multiple uh, storage backends uh, for Rook run in the same cluster? And the answer is yes. Uh, the full demo that I, I normally give that I'm gonna have more time shows Rook, Minio, CockroachDB all running on the same cluster, the same node, all at the same time. Uh, so there isn't any conflict there. Um, and then the other question about uh, you know, the, the persistent volumes for stateful sets, uh, those can also all, you know, there is great isolation in Kubernetes such that uh, you know, persistent volumes for one pod using one storage technology is not going to conflict with the persistent volume from another pod. And that's all stateful sets have underneath them are persistent volumes. So it's all abstracted apart and isolated too in different, uh, you know, uh, file system mount namespaces. So there's no conflicts there as well. So you can do all that at the same time, at the same node, all good. Now performance, that might be, you know, there might be some performance, cap uh, you know, uh, the conf conflicts there, but in terms of actual functionality conflict, there's none. And I think that is all the time that we have. So thank you very much, guys. I appreciate you coming here today.